Welcome to the latest in my Hammer Horror Review series. Today I'm covering The Brides of Dracula from 1960, which was the second in the Hammer Dracula series. This one was directed by Terence Fisher and written by Jimmy Sangster, a man who was writing so many films for Hammer around about this point, it's a wonder that he ever put his pen down to have his dinner. Now the title is a little bit misleading because there's no Dracula in this film and the vampire who is in the film does not get married or have any brides, technically, although I guess if the title of the film had been The Fiancé of Baron Meister, then it wouldn't have been as commercially enticing for the cinema-going public. I couldn't tell you why Christopher Lee was not in this one. I imagine it was scheduling conflicts. It's not like he was bored of the character by this point. He would go on to play Dracula in most of the sequels after The Brides of Dracula, so this was a bit of an anomaly. Peter Cushing's back, though, as Van Helsing, so it's not all bad. Cushing is more than capable of carrying a movie without Lee, no disrespect to Lee. So the story for this sees a young woman called Marianne travelling through what is presumably Dracula's old neck of the woods. She's heading to a new teaching job, but due to fortuitous circumstances, she ends up getting abandoned by her wagon driver in a nearby village, and she ends up spending the night at a local chateau which just happens to have the main vampire for this movie inside it. So she's in big trouble and so our tale begins. I have to say this is one of my favourite first acts out of any Hammer horror film. It's a really atmospheric journey that we go on following Marianne from stagecoach to village to chateau. I probably would have just used the word castle by the way but for the fact that it's explicitly called a chateau in the movie. I've not heard the word chateau in real life for a long, long time, mainly because nobody really rich ever invites me to their place in the mountains and no one's ever tried to marry me off to a vampire woman. Anyway, getting back to the movie, it's a really creepy opening on the whole. There's a sinister looking footman floating around who then just disappears from the movie. We're not quite sure as a viewer why the Baroness is befriending Marianne in the beginning. Is it because she wants to feed her to a vampire she's got up there? Or does she want to marry her off to a vampire, given the title of the film? So the fact that we've no idea just adds to our unease as we're watching these events unfold. The inside of the chateau is an amazing horror location. It just feels really big in scope. It's got this cool looking um, courtyard bit in the middle. I thought the castle from the first Dracula film looked better from the outside. We don't really get to see the outside of the chateau because it's too dark, but in terms of the inside, I definitely prefer the chateau. And if these are meant to be the descendants of the Dracula from the first movie, then as far as I'm concerned, Dracula did not get the better of the two gaps. Anyway, there's some really good horror hide and seek that goes on between Marianne and the Baroness. The actress who plays Marianne was called Yvonne Monlore. I'm not sure if I've got her name right. She was French. I say was. She sadly died three years ago. Uh, her credits on Wikipedia only go up to 1965. I don't know if she retired quite young or whether she just moved into more local productions, but she's an absolutely charming actress in this film. I was right behind her from an early stage. I can't even remember who the main girl was from the first Dracula movie in 58, and I only watched it a few months ago. I will certainly remember Yvonne Monlor more. By the time Peter Cushing shows up in the second act, I'm actually a little bit sad that we're switching point of view from Marianne. Now, if you're an actor or an actress who can make me want to spend more time watching you than Peter Cushing playing the amazing Van Helsing, then you're seriously doing something right. The second act is a little bit lighter than the first as Van Helsing is running around doing his detective thing, sometimes in the daytime. The script likes to have him as the straight man against quite a few weird personalities. Hammer films like to have drunkards as their random comedy characters, I've noticed. And in this instance, it's a doctor who's far more interested in having a quick tipple than he is providing any kind of diagnosis for his patients. But far funnier than him, actually, is the middle-aged woman who is the boss of Marianne at the school she ends up at. That, I did not expect that, by the way. I did not expect Marianne to get to her intended destination at any point during this story. But this woman, once she realises that Marianne and the Baron have got engaged, she says something like, ooh, they're like two turtle doves flying in the air, or something like that. It, it really struck me, that one. Now, on the subject of the Baron and Marianne getting married after just one day, it's I get that this was something that happened in the olden days, but it never fails to take me aback whenever I see it anew in, in some new film or another. 
it took me personally six months to ask my wife to marry me and I actually wondered if I was maybe rushing things even after six months I, I worried about that so that the idea that the Baron and Marianne or anybody would get engaged after one day is a little bit crazy to me unless I'm doing the movie a disservice and the Baron actually compelled Marianne to agree to be his wife with the red-eyed stare thing maybe it was that in fact I'm going with that as my theory because Marianne does or didn't seem like the sort of woman who would do that so readily get engaged because in the first act she seems really focused on just getting to her teaching job you know falling in love would seem like something she would want to maybe leave for further down the line that's the impression I would get from the character anyway so I'm going with the red eye thing Van Helsing's best scene comes when he gets to go to the chateau and poke around for clues but instead he just finds the Baron there waiting for him who if I've not made it clear by now is the main vampire in this film he also finds the Baroness there and there's this great confrontation between the three characters. It was at this point that I realised that all the best stuff in this movie is in the Chateau and that leads me on to my biggest complaint about it actually, which is that the ending doesn't also take place in said Chateau. It takes place instead in some really small barn. We've got three vampire characters by this point and an angry Van Helsing and they're trying to stage this elaborate fight in a really small space but I kind of think that they should have flipped the film and maybe had it open at the barn or on a farm somewhere Marianne could have stumbled across the Baron tied up to a cow post or something and then later on finish the film at the chateau with a big fight and maybe Van Helsing could have chucked the vampires over the balcony into the courtyard or something like that and some other things about the finale that I don't quite like. So the two female vampires, they just kind of stand at the back and don't get involved in the fight between Baron and Van Helsing. They're sort of like a couple of extras in a stage play. I know they're women, but they're still vampires. You know, get involved, girls. And then once the action moves outside, we never find out the fates of the two girls. I think we're meant to presume that they just go up in the flames. But I mean, they could have escaped out back, maybe. And also, it, it must feel like I'm really picking on this ending, but Van Helsing jumps up onto this windmill thing and straight away when he did this, I thought to myself, oh, he's trying to get the light here to kill the Baron down in the street. But it feels really dark when he does this. I thought to myself, there's not much natural light to work with, isn't there? Unless he's trying to get the light from the moon. But of course, when the camera then cuts to the Baron down on the cobblestone, it's suddenly much lighter and you can see the light sort of getting in between the shadows. But it didn't quite work for me that it wasn't as good in, re in reality seeing it play out as it probably looked on paper. There is one part of the finale though which I really liked bizarrely and that's when Van Helsing gets bit. Now at first I was like, whoa, no! But once I realised he had a way out of it I thought, oh that's really awesome. And those two minutes where he's sort of gearing up to burn himself with the poker, that's the best drama that Cushing gets to stick his teeth into in the whole movie. It's some really good stuff in there. And even though I wanted him to get out of that pickle, there's part of me that thinks it would have been interesting to see Van Helsing as a vampire and see how he would have coped with that. I mean, for all I know, if he goes on to turn into a vampire later in the series, I've no idea. In this movie, I don't think there was enough time for that to happen and for Cushing to do anything with it. If he'd have been bitten halfway through, then he would have had some time. But as it is, not in this movie. So on the whole, I do like The Brides of Dracula. It starts really strong and then it kind of levels out into stuff that's just kind of good and the ending is a little bit weak. This movie's kind of like a golfer who gets a lot of birdies on the front nine and then figures that maybe they can just par their way down the back nine and that'll be good enough for the trophy. They don't need to go attacking pins. If you don't know golf, then that's really a terrible analogy, but... For a direct sequel to an absolute classic like the 1958 Dracula, then this is an excellent second effort. It's got a really strong vampire. I've not really talked about him specifically, the Baron. Uh, it's got a great final girl. Not that that phrase existed probably back in 1960. Obviously, Peter Cushing as Van Helsing is always going to be good. And it's just a top, top movie. Now, before we get on to my final score for this, let me just quickly show you the copy of the movie that I own. I have this Blu-ray. In terms of features, it has a couple of documentaries within. And on the front, it claims that this is the most evil Dracula of all. Really? More evil than the Christopher Lee one? I'm not so sure. In fact, the Baron in this film has every right to be at least a little bit angry at the world, given the fact that his mum's been keeping him chained up for so long. Christopher Lee's Dracula is just evil because. So I think that's a false claim, personally. 
and I presume all these women are meant to be the Baron's brides. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six of them in the movie. There's only two, I think. So a bit of exaggerating going on on this front cover, I think. And this is one of those strange releases which has both a Blu-ray and a DVD. Now, if you've got the Blu-ray player, you're not really going to watch a DVD as well. And it, In fact, I'd have thought that most people have a machine which is capable of playing both. So I don't know if I'm just being naive here. It, it made more sense to me when you could buy one which was a Blu-ray and one which was a DVD. I mean, I mean, both in the same box is a little bit odd, but like I said, maybe I'm just being naive. Right, let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out my score for the Brides of Dracula. And a few axes fell out, that's good to see. We've got one, two, three, three and a half bloody axes out of five for the Brides of Dracula. That is just half an axe less than the four out of five, which I gave the original 1958 Dracula film, which did have Christopher Lee in it. So I will be back soon for another Hammer review. Eventually I will get to the third Dracula film, but I think the next one I'm going to tackle in terms of Hammer is the Dr. Jekyll film, which I think came out in either 1960 or 1961. I can't think of the title off the top of my head, and it will be a first time watch for me, so that'll be interesting. But for now, I will say adieu and see you later. Bye bye.